<coughs> uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the Physics Colloquium. And today's speaker is our own Professor Vesna Mitrovic. Um, according to Professor uh, Minachi Lorraine, that uh, Vesna doesn't need an introduction, but I will use one minute anyway. Um, Vesna, uh, we hired Vesna um, uh, shortly after she started her postdoc at Grenoble, and then we let her stay at her postdoc job uh, for uh, one more year, and then she came to Brown in 2004. And then, so one um, aspect of um, uh, Vesna's uh, quality that I admire the most is her um, perseverance, and when time goes tough, in uh, quantum physics of solid uh, was not that popular, but then now it's very popular, and then all of a sudden she's very popular. Um, and it is, uh, secondly, is her um, experimental physics style. You know, y if you watch the, the, the Big Bang Theory, Sheldon Cooper often insults people by saying that he's an experimentalist. But Vesna m makes that phrase a um, a proud phrase, right? Make us proud. Um, well, all the talk is cheap, the American way of saying. So I'm going to give her a gift to express my um, uh, appreciation. Okay, so this is a gift given to me um, by oh my God, no. a, a former professor, um, well, the late Professor Bob Beyer, and it was given to him by the, the late Bruce Lindsay. This is the original copy of the boy's thesis, 1929. <laughs> right now, there are only one copy in the world that's circulated. This is the second copy that <laughs> um, So I'm going to give it to you. It's in French. Uh, it's, um, it's about, um, you, know, you can guess what it says, right? Um, this is the boy's thesis. OK, so Mechanical I feel guilty. Uh, what? OK. okay. Uh, I feel Wait, guilty by touching it. Somehow I thought it should be uh, in some uh, library at Brown. But I thought, uh, you know, for me to keep it in my office is kind of a waste. So I'm going to give it to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I will make sure that um, if I don't give it to my younger colleague, I'll put it in my will to go to a library then. But at least I can read. I read you the introduction okay. the other day, right? All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not sure that's a good idea. Um, okay, so um, he would, she will tell us about all the uh, latest excitement in the quantum physics of solid materials. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so, um, not all, but some excitement, okay? Um, I won't talk about FFLO because that's a solved problem. Uh, they were looking for it in high energy physics and atomic, but never managed to find. So I think that revived condensed matter physics. So, but I will talk about magnetism and then try to explain really what I, I mean by these two kind of catchy words here, uh, meaning relativistic and quantum magnetism. So magnetism in itself, well, you need a magnetic moment, but that really, and we know how to describe that classically, but that's really not the whole story. If you really want to talk about magnetism, you need to consider spins. And these are my little two arrows that we always draw in you know, quantum mechanics class, right? So spin I and spin J. And this is what we saw, or what we write. Famous Heisenberg Hamiltonian that describes interaction of two spins. And so that's very nice for you know, introductory quantum mechanics, and you can make nice problems on your exam, right? But the problem becomes very quickly impossible. And people often say that even ancient Greeks knew about magnetism and we don't have the quantum theory of it yet, comprehensive theory. So one of the problems that is kind of easy to solve, quotation mark easy, is the spin. So the, the real problem becomes when you put many spins. And in the solids, of course, they sit on a lattice. One of the problems that it's, you know, has an easy solution that we even teach in classes is when you have basically what's called half filling in jargon, meaning you put one spin per lattice site, okay? And so you can actually, that's kind of the essence of what I'll talk about, MOT insulators, is that these insulating materials, 
And the reason why they insulate it is really the correlation, very strong electron interactions. You have this basically, and you can actually, oops, sorry, solve this by um, using what's called a Hubbard model. Why is this important is that, um, and I just touched that, is that this is, for example, a parent compound of high temperature superconductors in many materials. So once you start playing with this and taking these pins out, like one at a time, and try to see what happens, you can turn these insulators into metals, into very useful superconductors. Nobody knows how and why. We still don't have a comprehensive theory to explain that. So this is, as I said, uh, kind of an easy model to talk about this, what these smut insulators are. So according to Ben theory, they should be you know, either just simple superconduct uh, semiconductor or metal, and they're not. And the reason why they don't conduct is the very strong um, repulsion or interaction between electrons. And so this is a very famous problem that you can solve. You put your spins, sorry, one spin per lattice site, and then this is the Hamiltonian that describes this. So there are two energy terms here. There is what is called on-site repulsion. So these two electrons, they repel, they have right there both of same charge. And then there is also a term that describes how likely, or kinetic energy, how likely is this one electron to hop. If you notice, I label these spins kind of antiferromagnetically because if the orientation is the same, they cannot hop to the next site. It's a Pauli exclusion principle then that prevents this other electron of going on the same site, right? You can't have two of them. And so, um, how do we describe now the magnetism that arises in this material? And as I said, the problem is important because this is kind of the, where the starting point for, say, high temperature superconductors and so on. And so you can rep the problem can be solved very easily, well, in this limit. When you have very strong on-site repulsion, so very strong electron correlations compared to this kind of hopping term, T. And so you can represent each spin here, just as spin one half on each side, and you know that complicated Hamiltonian that I wrote reduces to this, where J, this exchange, inter so the interaction term between is just given like this in terms of this kind of kinetic energy that fights this repulsion on a site, okay? And so we're back again to this Heisenberg kind of a Hamiltonian, okay? And, okay, this is great, it works for this, but once you start either taking electrons or putting more or complicating the lattice from this square, changing it to triangle, this does not hold, okay? So we really don't know what to, you know, do with it. And let me just show you a phase diagram so that on this axis here, so this is a theoretical phase diagram, you see it's this parameter that kind of tells you, it tells you how strong the correlation or interactions between electrons are. And you know, when interactions, so this is this axis here, let's stay at zero, you know, when they're weak, you just have band theory, you know, like things behave like what we are taught in that Oscar, Ashcroft and Merman, for those of you who have taken basic solid state physics. So, you know, you count electrons and you can determine whether, you know, what the band theory tells you. You turn on stronger interactions, you end up in this smut insulating phase. So, you know, people like to say, because they're interacting so strongly and the repulsion is so strong, you basically, you know, they self-localize themselves, electrons supposedly. So you get an insulator, even though according to Ben theory, it should be something else, okay? Now, this is where it brings me to a second thing in my talk. So I first discussed the quantum nature, so describing the spin in a quantum world, right? Heisenberg Hamiltonian, how complicated situation can be. Brings me to why did I use a relativity in my title, and that is that you can actually bring into game another parameter, which is very popular these days, and that's spin-orbit coupling. So here, on this axis, on x-axis, we have a strength of the spin-orbit coupling. So, meaning that you have interactions, you have complicated, you know, atomic orbitals, so ele electronic spin is really not a good quantum number anymore in a real material. So what matters is also orbital kind of motion of electron, and that's purely relativistic effect, thus the title, right? And so you can see that, for example, if we are here and just consider spin-orbit coupling, so spin-orbit coupling became extremely popular lately, it's because it's a kind of a main ingredient to, again, move from this kind of simple either metal or band insulator into topological, to give you topological insulators or semi-metals. So it's a main ingredient of that, okay? And now when you put two together, 
okay, you get these very exotic phases here. I'm sure my colleagues from high energy theory would appreciate axion insulators, whale semi-metals, topological mod insulators, spin orbit couple of mod insulators here, spin liquids, and these quadrupolar phases that I'll talk later what they are. Now, uh, so if you're a theorist and you, you know, it's nice to make these pictures of what we expect. So this is what I'm going to talk about. But let me just kind of uh, give you an essence of why this is an extremely difficult problem to solve. So imagine everything that happens to one electron depends on also all the others and, you know, thousands, millions of them that you have in a metal, right? And then spin, instead of now being the simple error, right, and writing it this way, well, usually spin here looks something like this now. If you plot the spin density when you have spin orbit coupling, right, it's, you know, you don't have this localized little error, okay, or you can't really write this. So this is actually a real picture of calculated kind of co composite spin for a particular material that are very popular, iridates. They're actually an example of this kind of stuff here, okay, well, semi-metals. And so the question is, how do now, what is the effect of Hamiltonian and how we describe the magnetism in this when we have this kind of, you know, entanglement between the orbital, orbital motion of electrons and the spin degrees of freedom. Now, uh, what is necessary actually, according to all the theorists, is to be able to probe these systems with some kind of a local probe. And the reason is, again, you have to be able to kind of locally look at this kind of distribution of the spin and be able to probe that. Yeah. It's a calculated spin density for uh, iridates, which are a very popular material. They sit somewhere, you know, around here, okay, Should on the I face. Think about things a little bit like what I would have seen in chemistry in terms of lows, but now Yes, like yes, system. and it's an effective J for spin one-half calculation, again, of the effective spin density in a particular material, yeah. It looks even worse than that. This is a simple one. This is supposed to be a one-half, J one-half in this particular oxide of iridate. So yes, think of it like the probability distribution of the position of elect, well, I don't know even how to say this. It's not the position like the chemistry, it's the spin density, okay? okay. So whatever that, whatever that means. Uh -huh. Yes, on a single site. So basically whatever one arrow upstate turn into this mess in space now, you see? Yeah, in spin space. So if you have a probe that probes spin spatial distribution, that's what you're supposed to see, okay? So the absence of spin orbit coupling. Mm -hmm. It would be just an arrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Up down, exactly. So that's why it refers to actually, so J one half, this is upstate, this is downstate, okay? So this is for those of us who love basic physics, this is interesting, but I can tell you that spin orbit coupling is actually very important from practical point of view, other than giving you topological phases. So whoever dreams of making a quantum computer needs to deal with this uh, consequences or whatever topological phases that physics gives you, the famous spin momentum locking that comes from spin orbit coupling. And also on a more, um, I'll come back to this, on a more practical note, um, in spintronics, this is a very important interaction. And I just give you an example of certain uh, paper, the review article that was actually copying how to do this, what's called magnon dynamics, tronics, using spin to do electronics, and trying to actually transfer these kind of Goldstone zero energy modes, magnon spin waves through a material, and then talks about making a rectifier of spin with this torque. You see these equations, they're all actually classical, semi-classicals, right? There's no way we know how to predict this. And so where we are from a practical point of view is, you know, we make a material, we know that it has spin orbit coupling because you use heavy elements. And then, you know, you go and irradiate with the uh, microwaves and you hope to get something and you test it, right? The theory is not, it's all semi-classical. So like the NMR in the old days, right? It doesn't really work. It doesn't tell you a lot of things. So it would be nice if we have a um, way of dealing with the spin orbit coupling and predicting and calculating the properties so that you know we don't we know how to make these devices more efficient okay and what is it that we need to tweak so that's on a practical note to go back to uh, you know complicated theories 
we have list of, again, depend, you know, kind of off these phases here. So they're all listed. This is all nice and fancy jargon words. But here it tells you what the properties or order parameter is. So, you know, fractional quantum Hall effect, you have this and that, all these exotic things that hopefully one day we can actually use to make something, you know, like a fancy quantum computer or so on. And this is why we want to study this stuff. And so um, let me go here and how did this skip to this? I'm missing a lot of stuff. OK, sorry for this. Kind of got shuffled. So we found there are, according to theory, there are perfect materials, this what I call 5D uh, double perovskites that actually are right here in the middle of this. So where they have very strong interact electron correlations and also extremely strong spin orbit coupling. OK, and so this is a kind of unit cell or formula of this particular material that kind of has all these features that you need, OK? And it has one unpaired electron, so it would be one electron per site, OK? And it has this, um, so it's a cubic symmetry, the simplest possible, but it's face center cubic. So that's kind of frustrated in a sense. They're a little bit complicated than just a simple cube. And it has very large magno separation of these ions. So T is small in that formula that I started with. So it's truly a MOT insulator. OK? And let me, yeah? Okay, so if I look at that um, MOT mm -hmm. insulator, it's a simple metal uh, sure. transition. Yeah. And then if I look at that one, it's, it's pointing downward. So if I sit somewhere in the parameter of U over T, mm -hmm. if I go horizontally, it yeah. depends too long on the lambda. The spin orbit coupling strength. Mm -hmm. and I go through a metal insulator transition. Yes. Okay, so is there a simple physical picture can be presented for that? With if you're going this way no, or you go that, that way? way yes. That way. Why, would it, uh, why do you cross basically here with the spin orbit coupling? Right. Why would the orbital decrease freedom make the metal into an insulator? It, it, orbital like degrees of freedom would actually, it can effectively, and this is an example in this material, so the spin is three halves. Orbital degrees in a lattice makes it effective one half. It, puts, it makes it more quantum, okay? It, you know, theorists say that you purify, okay? And so what happens is actually you are effectively lowering your J. Remember, J is T squared over U. So it's, the, the effect of spin orbit coupling here is the same as actually Lower, if you lower J, that means the U is smaller, right? And, and it's, it's the same as going this way. So the J is weak, sorry, the spin orbit coupling is weakening the interaction, the J, the super exchange. So it's making it more. Maybe U bigger. Yeah. Maybe U bigger. Because it make the quantum uh, repulsion stronger. You make, uh, so, sorry, you're making J stronger, sorry, that's why, right? Yeah, you're making J, U is goes down, yeah. And you make it J stronger because you have extra paths for super exchange, right? More overlap if you involve the orbital, OK? That's why it goes that way. So let me just, uh, I need to, OK. So, and, and this is kind of your question, you know, and this is again to kind of summarize what's happening, is that if you take, look at that particular material, OK? So again, this is a calculation of theory, what you should have, these very fancy quadrupolar phases. So if you just do a simple counting, OK, like band theory, like how many electrons I have, what's my lattice, blah, blah, I should have an effective spin of 3 halves on face center cubic lattice. And that everybody can calculate, supposedly. Well, you know, you, DFT you can use and predict what the property should be. And according to this, what I'll actually explain now, these kind of no, new quantum theories, this is actually the interaction is very unusual. Multi, it involves this, you know, the fancy clouds that I showed that you, Jim, asked me what, how to view that, okay? And it turns out that because of these kind of interactions of these relativistic spin orbit effects that the effective spin of the system actually becomes one half. So your system is actually becomes more quantum. You know, the lower the spin, the more quantum your system is, okay? And, uh, it predicts that you should, you know, under basically these kind of very complicated quadrupolar orbitally ordered phases should precede magnetism. And that's what drives magnetism, okay? That's the prediction.
Okay? And so what do you mean by more if it's a spin higher the spin number, your system is less quantum. The quantum fluctuations, right? The what I mean by quantum, I literally mean that imagine I'm living in a zero temperature world and I'm talking about uncertainty, right? So only spin one half has much larger uncertainty than any higher spin. So quantum fluctuations are more important the lower the spin number. So in that sense, it's more quantum, okay? So any classical description of the magnetism then becomes more or less relevant, so to speak, okay? And uh, I don't know how my slides got shuffled, but let me just go back here, okay? So this is the theory. Let me explain what, you know, I just kind of told you what in jargon what to expect. But this is the essence of this, what's called a quantum models. And the, um, this was developed or started to develop in 2010 in a group of Leon Balance at, uh, in Santa Barbara. So he's really pioneering this kind of physics or description of the systems that have spin orbit coupling. And of course, you represent now the spin with this J composite, you know, and you project to this new. Sp so the point being is that you, you write something that kind of looks like Heisenberg Hamiltonian, right? This term here, exactly the same as I showed you, but it includes this multipolar spin couplings here. See, each one of these spins now is actually, you know, you look, you, you would get fourth order or sixth order terms in spin now, okay? So you have, you know, fourth, sixth order products of the spin. Looks like a Heisenberg Hamiltonian, but, you know, not quite. So huge uh, kind of this uh, directionally dependent exchange couplings between the spins, okay? So, right, it, you start here, it looks like Heisenberg, except that each of these spins is represented in terms of J, this new space, and it, you can see that the product of the spins would involve, you know, fourth, sixth order in spin, basically. And then good luck solving that, right, which Leon did. And he made two very important predictions out of this solving this complicated theory, and the prediction is actually quite clear. It says the following. If you look at the local spin expectation value, and again, that's because you have that cloud, right? Not a single error now. That local spin ex expectation value should be different than a bulk. And to put it in another word, if I have a local probe like NMR that I'll talk about it, uh, what I find should be different than what the person measuring magnetization in a squid does. I've never seen that before, but that's what it should happen here. And before, what drives the magnetism is this structural change or this quadrupolar orbital phase, okay? That structural change or breaking of the symmetry of the lattice should happen before you go into the long range order magnetism. So those are very clear predictions of the theory that is something easy to test, especially with uh, basically uh, with the NMR that I will discuss how we have done this. And the, we, first of all, by this, this here stands for nuclear magnetic resonance techniques that I use in my lab. And so we can actually probe this because we have a local probe. And I'll also show you not just that you can locally probe the spin, but throughout the material. So it's a bulk local probe. But in addition, I'll show you how if you choose your nuclei or nature correctly and do the correct things, you can actually concurrently probe or choose what do you want to probe, either spin or these orbital degrees of freedom. So you can get an information. You see, you, you can do this, right? Test this by you doing neutron scattering and you know that your sample turn, you know, uh, that has long range order magnetism and you can figure out much faster than by NMR what this magnetic order is. However, uh, then you would have to do maybe resonant X-ray scattering and not even, depending on what is deforming, right? If oxygen orbitals are involved, you cannot <laughs> discover that. So you would have to do two different um, experiments to show that you have this structural transition preceding magnetism. And then, you know, if the f effect is small, you know, nobody can guarantee that your thermometers are the same and everything is set up that one actually precedes the other. So it's very useful to be able to do that with one single technique in situ, right? So uh, before I go on about the NMR and tell you how we do this, I just want to tell you something that 
has been known by my colleagues from Stanford. In 2007, as a matter of fact, they look at this material, this barium, sodium, osmium, and oxygen-6. I don't even remember the formulas because that's really not important here. It's important that it's a moth insulator, right, with a strong spin-orbit coupling. And what they found out, so these are the kind of the main finding, is that the, the material has, in a paramagnetic state, so in high temperatures, the, you see this Curie-Weiss constant in jargon is minus 10. So what this actually implies is that you do measurements with squid, with magnetometer, and you find out that interactions are antiferromagnetic. That's what this minus sign here implies, okay? They're quite strong, and they're um, antiferromagnetic. The moment is about 0.6 Bohr magneton, and they found out that this material orders ferromagnetically at below 6.8 Kelvin. So below 6 Kelvin is, it has long range order, it's a mag in a ferromagnetic state. The problem is that what they found is that when it orders, its moment actually drops to 0.2 Bohr magneton. So it's a, they call it weak ferromagnet, right? So suddenly like the moment got reduced. And there is even a bigger problem. So again, if you do this chemistry, you count spins and orbitals and electrons, you, this, this is what the effective spin should be, three halves. And they, you know, how did they find out that there is this transition, right? So they measure specific heat, you see here? And if you look at the entropy in this transition that it's released, so what you have to do is integrate this, right? To get the entropy, actually what they find that, this is the entropy they found when they integrate. There's R ln of two, two degrees of freedom. That tells you that the spin that underwent this magnetic transition is just one half, not three halves. Right? So there is a problem of missing entropy here. And if you look at the magnetization versus the angle of like a apl little applied field to figure that out, you find that it's a ferromagnet with the moment, easy axis, right? The moments are oriented along this 110 diagonal direction of the cube. You cannot get that from Landau theory for magnetism. Impossible in expansion. You know, the ferromagnet should the moments should point along the one of the crystalline axis of this cube because the system is completely symmetric, okay? So these were kind of mysterious uh, experimental finding back from 07, okay? So, which by the way got all explained uh, by, I'll show you how and why. And so before I go on, um, I'll tell you we solved the mystery and this is how. So this is a kind of a preview of what we find, what we found out by NMR, and that is, so I'm plotting a phase diagram first uh, field versus temperature here, so the results I showed you with these thermodynamic measurements were done, as a matter of fact, uh, as a function of temperature, so right here on this axis, so you go from paramagnetic state to this ferromagnetic state, okay, and so what we found out and as I said, just to kind of a preview here, as you lower the temperature, so it goes from red to blue, right? We have, at high temperatures, you have a paramagnetic state here in a perfect cubic symmetry of the crystal. I'll tell you how we know that, independent of any other measurement. And then as you cool down, okay, regardless of what the field is, you enter this phase that we call a broken local point symmetry. I actually called it point local cubic symmetry, but then it was BCS, you know, in there, so not to confuse with BCS, we, we actually uh, changed the name on all the figures. So thus, the broken local point symmetry, not the cubic, it is cubic, but you know, not to have a BCS in there, okay? So it's the phase that it's, again, you're para, it's a paramagnetic phase, there's no long range magnetic order, but the, these, you see these little blue things are kind of oxygen atoms around, they are deforming, they, so the local symmetry is not cubic anymore. So that's this green phase here. And as you lower further temperature, you actually enter into this uh, ferromagnetic state. C stands for canted antiferromagnet, sorry. And again, the symmetry is not cubic, okay? So that's what we found out. And let me tell you now, walk you through how and what all of this. And this is exactly what that quantum model that I call for short, with this complicated multipolar exchange predicts is that you are in a paramagnetic state here, you actually, you need to see the breaking of cubic symmetry or a structural symmetry before you go into this 
uh, long range order magnetic phase. And I'll also show you that the properties of this phase are all in agreement with this kind of uh, complicated calculation. Okay. Uh, so how do we do all of this? Uh, as I said, we did NMR, and it tells us a lot about magnetism. So when we record the spectra that I'll be showing you, okay, I just want you to remember that that gives us a, a basically image of local magnetic field probability distribution. Okay? And so what we have done in particular here, osmium atom carries a spin, S, here. This is sodium nuclei. We actually did all the work on a sodium. There is a reason, you'll see in the next slide, why uh, sodium was chosen. And I denotes nuclear spin. And so there is an interaction between the two. Um, so this is the moment. So what we actually measure is an internal magnetic field that it's right here at the sodium site. That field includes whatever we apply, plus you know, magnetic field that it's created by this moment, by this spin of osmia, OK? Spin, whatever that means, OK? Whether it's a cloud or an arrow, it creates a magnetic field at this particular site here. And you know, this um, term that kind of projects one to the other, it's called hyperfine coupling constant. So it's really an overlap of the quantum wave functions of these two spins, OK? Uh, and kind of impossible to calculate, but you can find it experimentally, and I'll come back to that. And so, you know, if you do um, NMR measurements in, say, you know, a simple ferromagnet, I'm just going to show you what you expect to see. So, in a simple ferromagnet, let's say this is a resonant frequency of your nucleus. If it was resonating, you know, just in a field in vacuum, there were no interactions. There's nothing, no other electrons or spins to create internal field, and if you have a ferromagnet where you know these arrows here are electronic spins, right? So you see they create an extra local field, right? And basically just shifts your resonance, and you just see some kind of a little delta function with final width, okay? And this distance here actually allows you to then relate this to magnetic moment. If it's a ferromagnet, you're going to see two peaks, okay? And they are actually separated on the opposite side, right? So all the nuclear spins that are sitting let's say, right here, that are coupled to the moment pointing up, they're going to be shifted up in frequency. They feel higher local field. And then the ones that are right here underneath or coupled to the spins that are pointing down, they're going to, you know, that field is canceling the applied field, so it's going to be shifted down with respect to this, you know, vacuum frequency, right? And so you can use that to uh, calculate, again, the moments and see how the spins are arranged. If you have this kind of you know, spiral or you know, incommensurate kind of waves, this is what you would see. These are just simply probability distributions of these uh, structures here. Okay? Now, it brings me to something that is a little bit less known. Uh, this is what everybody supposedly knows about NMR, even when we do lab experiments right? Uh, in physics 156 and 210. But that is, there, there is this quadrupolar interaction. And this is why we chose to work on this sodium. Okay? So for, if your nucleus has a spin larger than 1 half, it actually possesses quadrupolar moment. So it's not symmetric. Okay? So it possesses this quadrupolar moment Q. And it turns out that this you know, particular quantity can interact with the electric field gradient of the electronic charge. Okay? And it gives us very useful splittings. And we can actually, you know, by looking at this NMR line, really measure, say, the strength of these electric field gradients. The point being is that by doing this kind of you know, NQR measurements or nuclear quadrupolar resonance, you can obtain information about you know, electronic charge. Okay? So basically, any local lattice or charge distribution deformations or asymmetries that arise in your system, you can actually uh, see that. Okay? So just to go into an important point here, and I'll be quick now. So as I said, your nucleus has to possess a quadrupolar moment, Q, and that interacts with electric field gradient. So supposedly, this is my nucleus now with a quadrupolar moment. You see it has some kind of a charge asymmetry. 
and it interacts with this electric field gradient. This is just the principal axis of this electric field gradient. Now, of course, you have to look at you know, the charge of the electron and so on and so on. And there is something very useful developed by Wigner, Eckhart theorem, that allows you to represent these orbital or a charge, right, degrees of freedom in terms of spin to map into a spin space. And so you do that, and you end up with this Hamiltonian here. And I won't suffocate you with the details of it. But the important thing is that this Hamiltonian is actually square in the spin number. You see, nuclear spin. Even though it probes the charge, it maps into that. So it's different than the Zeeman Hamiltonian, which is just you know the field times the spin. This is a second order. I mean, it's a quadratic in spin number. So it gives you very peculiar dependencies on magnetic field that are different than what happens in a Zeeman world. Okay. The important thing is you can you know diagonalize this, find what the energy levels are, right? Find this, and then what we actually probe is this the difference right between these levels and so you find what you find at the end of the day that the you know these difference between these energy levels of these splittings that we can probe are scaled scaling as the magnitude of the quadrupolar moment which is you know god given for a particular nucleus you cannot tweak that nature gives you this and the electric field gradient here of the electronic charge and so in you know just to kind of go into what I, it turns out that when you have a cubic symmetry, for example, this electric field gradient is zero, right? There are no gradients of charge if everything is cubic, symmetric. If you now, if you don't have cubic symmetry when you break that, you know, depending on the size of this electronic, the, you know, you might just see a single line that it's much broader than this, okay? Or you know, if the electric field gradient is large, you can actually literally see this splitting. It all depends on the little technicalities of the natural weights of your line. Sodium that we chose to work on is, has a spin of three halves. So it actually, this is an example of the energy diagrams for this particular nucleus, as a matter of fact. And I just want to show you that this is indeed what we see here. So, you know, I kind of gave you a prelude of what we found. But this is literally what we see in an experiment. You see, this is 20 Kelvin, so any high temperature you see a very narrow spectrum of sodium. It's because the crystal is perfect. It's single crystal. It's paramagnetic. It has cubic symmetry. So one little line. It almost looks like a perfect delta function. No width to it, how pure the crystal is, okay? or how perfectly cubic it is, so to speak. right? And then what happens, so here, electric field gradient is 0 around. This is sodium. There is oxygen around. Osmium are these red guys that carries spin, but you know, oxygen carries a lot of charge, right? It has 16 electrons, right? Something like that. Uh, and it's all arranged in a perfect cubic symmetry so that there's no splitting whatsoever, right? And then what happens, you cool down, right? And you see, you're still in a paramagnetic phase. Nothing is happening, no magnetism. And look at, for example, 11 Kelvin. You have this extremely broad line, right? Even at 12, it starts broadening. If electric field gradient starts to develop, you, that broadens your line. Okay? Uh, I do know that it's not magnetic because Hamiltonians look different. There are tricks you can do to make sure that that's the case. Okay? And, and then eventually, as you see, it broadens. And then here you start seeing one, two, three peaks, three peaks. And then, OK, you see here at the low temperature, you see clearly three peaks, which you expect for spin one, half, three halves if the electric field gradient is you know, sufficiently large. Okay? So basically here, and all of these splittings here, tells us that we, have, we broke cubic symmetry locally. Okay? And the fact that you see this, you see there are at low temperatures, right? So there's this triplet. That's what I label by 1 in Roman units. And this, this one, this triplet. These are two magnetically inequivalent sites, meaning that the reason why I see three spins is because the cubic symmetry is broken, because I have you know, electric field gradient around my sodium. The reason why I have two triplets okay, at two very different frequencies is that it's because magnetic environment is not the same. Okay? 
And as a matter of fact, it tells you that this order is commensurate because there are two well-developed peaks. You see there's nothing in between them. It's basically a zero intensity of the signal. Okay? And the order is ferromagnetic. Okay? Why? I have two. How can that be ferromagnetic? I just showed you a quantum ferromagnet. The point is, if you look where zero is, okay, see, it's here. They're both shifted on the same side of zero. So there are two magnetically equivalent sites, and I'll explain what that means. But for now, I want to go back to this symmetry breaking, okay, uh, and just look at these splittings of the lines. So I, you know. I want to convince you that you should believe me that this little thing that I call delta here, the splitting of these triplets, comes from quadrupolar interaction. Well, you know, again, I said the Hamiltonian that looks like you're projecting z square spin square onto the field. So it's very easy to see what's going to happen. What is it that I should see if I take the magnetic field, okay, and I rotate the direction of the magnetic field? Okay, so it's as if I'm changing the direction of this spin here, iz square. Well, it's just a projection of this onto the field, so it's a cosine square function of the angle. And so what one can do is one can, so there are two things that, if this is true, if it comes from this electric degrees of freedom, electric charge, okay, you can change the strength of the applied field. Anything magnetic is going to depend on a magnetic field. The Zeeman Hamiltonian depends, splitting depends on a field. This one doesn't, okay? So the quadrupolar Hamiltonian, the strength, right, or the splitting, is just the electric field gradient plus, you know, the whatever, the moment of the nuclei. So we measure this in fields from 5 Tesla to 29 Tesla, and the splitting was the same, okay? Doesn't matter. You know, any of these orbital degrees of freedom, that's a very high energy scale, right? You cannot affect that with the fields of 30 Tesla, no matter how high that looks, sounds to us, right? That's nothing in energy to affect the orbital motion, okay? And then you can also do, you can rotate the direction of this field, and you should follow these particular lines, and that's exactly what we have here. You see these dots here are basically splitting between these two, and then angle between one of the crystalline axes in the applied field, and you know, the line is actually what the theory tells you, and that's what you see. You can also rotate in different planes of the crystal and so on, and be 100% sure to know. So the point is that we did not observe any dependence on this splitting on a magnetic field. Okay, so it's completely f independent of the strength of the field, and also it has the particular, you know, angular, dip it looks the same as you rotate, as it should according to this simple. This is nothing else but pure quantum mechanics. This has nothing to do with magnetism and nothing. It's just the simple quantum mechanics of magnetic resonance, okay? And it does indeed follow that. And so what that tells us is that really the splitting into these triplets comes from the fact that, you know, electric field gradient is non-zero, that the local cubic symmetry in our material is broken, okay? Then, you know, you can look at these asymmetries. Again, it's a more theory. Imagine that your electric field gradient is anisotropic, so you can, you know, project it along these axes, so on. This is what's called a symmetry parameter here. I'm not going to, you know, suffocate you with theory here. Again, it's just pure quantum mechanics, nothing to do with, you know, any physics of this material, right? It turns out that what you can do is you can rotate the magnetic field either along, say, uh, let me show you here, uh, either along in this diagonal direction. So say from one cubic axis to diagonal 110, you can do rotations along the sides of the cube. And that will tell you very different things. And so we did that. And what that allows us, because of these anisotropy here, we, it allows us to really figure out where are the axis of these electric field gradients with respect to the crystalline axis. Okay? And so long story short, it really, um, you know, we, we can look at all these different rotations and we can be 100% sure that, as a matter of fact, the principal axis of this electric field gradient, they coincide with those of the crystal. And more importantly, by, again, doing these rotations, of whether it's, you know, from one axis to diagonal or the sides, we were able to actually determine exact nature of this distortion. So this is what's happening, is that uh, the 
at low temperature phase, this magnetic phase is actually uh, generated by orthorhombic distortions. So basically, these oxygen octahedra that sit around sodium, they distort into these uh, orthorhombic distortions. This is what's happening in the magnetically ordered phase, in that you know, BCS kind of phase, just that paramagnetic phase where the symmetry is broken. The distortions are tetragonal. They still didn't develop that fully. Okay? So by looking at all these things, you can actually determine the exact symmetry of these distortions. And now that's the, um, okay? I want to go to magnetism. So I just said it's ferromagnetic. Remember, we have a lot of problems in experiments that was found where problem of the easy axis in a small moment, missing entropy, all of that is unsolved, okay? And so this is what I'm actually plotting here to look at the magnetism. So we were able to actually determine the exact spin orientation and just very briefly in remaining time to tell you how. So I'm plotting two quantities out of my experiment. Well, what we measure is frequency, but frequency you just have to multiply by gamma, gyromagnetic ratio, and obtain magnetic field. So I will talk about fields here instead of you know, frequencies because it's technique specific. And so what I'm actually plotting here is what we call uniform field and staggered field, okay? And so this is how we calculate the uniform field. Think of it as triplet one. I don't really care about these little details in there. That's quadrupolar interaction, okay? So breaking of cubic symmetry. But what I'm going to plot is uniform field. You see, it's an average field at the site one here plus the average field at the site two, triplet two, divided by two. So statistically speaking, it's a first moment. It's the average of the magnetic field of this whole line, okay? And staggered is the difference of the two, okay? So it's like an order parameter for an antiferromagnet, right? It's a staggered moment. So that's exactly what these two are. And so if you look here, this is actually scaled at different applied fields. So this is a uniform moment, and this is staggered moment plotted versus temperature, and you see that as you cool down, of course, you develop this moment. You see that the uniform moment actually here at 7 Tesla, this is 15, at 29 is even higher. So it grows, uniform moment grows as you apply the field. And it should, you know, you apply the magnetic field, you polarize your system more. Staggered, on the other hand, stays constant, right? That's a difference of these two sites. That stays constant as a function of applied field. And so, um, let me tell you that this has enough information for us to actually figure out what the exact magnetic order is. So what, you know, remember the theory said that all the local spin expectation values are different than the uh, bulk. And so what we have done to, in order to figure out the exact local, you know, uh, alignment of the spins, we, ha we have followed these uniform and staggered field as a function of the angle here of the applied field. So what you do is you apply the field along one original cubic lattice, and then you rotate that, and you look, right, for what happens to these uniform and staggered fields. Uniform field is just an average magnetization. It should scale as magnetization that you measure with squid or any other magnetometer, you know? And this is where the mystery comes. So what I'm plotting here is the magnetization from the group of, that was done back in 07 from my colleagues at Stanford. And this is our data. So this is a uniform field, the quantity that should scale. It should be the same. OK, this little angle problem here, that could just be different goniometers. But the point is that we do not find the maximum moment along this direction. So it's quite different okay, from the bulk. That's what the theory told us, that it should happen. right? So it's kind of neat but that doesn't tell us anything yet. And so now I'm going to use this data here that we looked at so that we can see all the anisotropies to figure out what the exact magnetic order is, OK? And this is how we do this. So this complicated measurement here, OK? So all these points are our data of uniform field on this axis, and these blue are staggered fields. So that's all information we need to figure out the exact magnetic ordering. This is how you do it. So you have to calculate, remember that on each sodium, what we measure is, so we have two sodium sites. That's why I'm only plotting. I 
I don't really care about the whole crystal. This is enough. And what we measure is an internal field, right, at, that is created by these osmia. You see this red? This is osmium. It carries spin. So now I'm neglecting, you know, spin orbit coupling and my clouds and all that, Jim. I'm representing the spins as a single error, but really not doing, uh, not losing anything. And we calculating, right? So we have a moment, right? In particular direction, we know what this hyperfine supposedly uh, tensor is, and you calculate the internal field. And so, you know, you basically do this simulations and calculations, and you treat both the magnitude, you treat the direction of this moment, as well as this as a free parameter, okay, fit parameter. You have your data, and so you calculate these, you know, you rotate. This is actually applied field here, unit vector of the applied field. So you project along the applied field. This is why we did these measurements actually with these angles, and you see these lines here are actually simulations, meaning there's a calculations. And so what we found, the following. So you can fit the data and you find that the moment is about 0.6 Bohr magneton. That's exactly the moment that's found in paramagnetic state, not 0.2 like the other guys found, you know. And the, this is how the spins are arranged. As a matter of fact, we have, so spins are arranged ferromagnetically, but you see one plane. Unfortunately, you cannot see. This is shaded to denote. So there is a plane B here and plane A. And if you look at both planes, in each plane you have osmium is ordered ferromagnetically. Okay, so there is a projection here. You see, they're all pointing in this direction. Okay, in this plane, they're all pointing in this direction, B direction. So they are ferromagnetically ordered in each plane, and they are staggered. Okay, so you see they're they're. Uh, kind of pointing away from this easy axis, one, one, zero, okay? And this angle is huge, 65 degrees. If you project that, this is why you find when you do the measurement, you know, you find that point, about point two, you find extremely small moment because they are staggered big time. And just to kind of, you don't have to do, do any calculations in your head, but just to kind of, you see this particular sodium, you can see why you get two sides just very simple, in a simple way, where you see this guy is coupled to four spins of B type, right? So you project them along the applied field, they would all give you one number, right? And then you have these two here. And if you project them, because they're pointing in a different direction along the applied field, they would give you a different field right here. So it's like there are four of B and two of A's. This guy sees four A's and two B's. So it's a very different, because of the projection along the field, will give you a different internal fields. So you get two sides here. And anyhow, one more technical issue and then I'm done, okay? And that is, uh, brings me, so this is what we figure out, and it brings me to the problem of this, you know, we said that we saw this breaking of a cubic symmetry. So according to this you know, theory, this should really be a quadrupolar phase, meaning the phase in which you know, quadrupolar moments now of electronic or orbitals, electronic orbitals are ordered. So these are all spin densities or charge density on these you know, proposed, right? On these particular sites, okay? So very complicated order. Um, you know, I treated my spins as single arrows here, spin one half, right? Even though at the very beginning of the talk, I said that this is not the right thing to do, right? And that things are complicated. So all of that complexity of the spin or this complicated orbital exchange, you know, the fact that spins are now interacting in this very anisotropic, you know, sixth order in spin interaction is actually found here. So we treat this Hyperfine coupling tensor is nothing else but it's the overlap of the wave function of this very complicated exchange path, okay, and your nuclear spin, which is as simple as it gets, right? It's a little spin in true sense of the word. And as a matter of fact, you see in paramagnetic phase, this thing is just a diagonal tensor. That's all. So we actually keep this thing. It's impossible to change that the same, but we allow these guys here off diagonal to vary. And this is what we found. The only way to fit our data is to actually have all these off diagonal terms. 
which are quite significant, as a matter of fact, about one third of the value of the diagonal ones. It tells you that these overlaps are quite strong or an isotropy. And as a matter of fact, it turns out that you know, if you open a book on any paper that you, before this material, you know, we actually always look at the point symmetry group of your crystal, of your magnetic structure. And that's what this has to reflect. So if you're dealing with the, you know, a normal, ordinary material, okay, not the one that has this complicated spin-orbit coupling, you know, this, if I told you that the lattice has orthorhombic distortion, this should actually reflect that symmetry group, this guy here. So it should only have two off-diagonal terms. That's it, these two here. Everything else should be zero. If you put that, you cannot explain. And so what this actually tells you, again, that this, is, this particular tensor is actually an experimental way of probing basically this, you know, the clouds, okay, or this very complicated exchange paths because it does not reflect any symmetry of the crystal at all. Even with distortions, you cannot explain the magnetism, okay? Anyway, so we were basically to kind of end here, supposedly on time, is, okay, great. Somebody's giving a false, okay, I just have to put the conclusion on. I think the, the easiest way to do this is to just stop and go there. And so, um, ta -da. So, as I said, that, yeah, I'll do it by hand. Anyway, so, as I said that, we have actually detected these you know, broken local cubic symmetry phase. So breaking of the local symmetry that was predicted that precedes magnetism by these uh, kind of quantum models. And then we're able to actually really discern this magnetic um, phase. Um, and I would just like to end, anyway, that's the end result. And thank to my collaborators, um, Ian Fisher at Stanford who provided the samples and a lot of all of the initial work on this thermodynamic characterization was done by, in his group. Uh, a lot of discussion with the theorists, Leon Balance, who actually developed all these uh, theories of how to treat this quantum theory uh, of magnetism, or Neil Reyes, who helped us with experiments at high fields. And then all the Brown crew, my students, Lou was doing all the magnetic um, uh, simulations to figure out the order. Van Kong Liu, who is graduating next week, uh, he did all the stuff of electric field gradients to symmetry calculations. And now we have two new guys, Rong and uh, Eric, in the audience who are actually continuing this. So I'll stop here. Thanks. OK. All right. Um, Let's ask questions. Yes. Okay. Oh. <laughs> that way it's on the lecture couch. Yeah, maybe it's quiet. Yeah. <laughs> very, very nice best night. The, I, I'm curious to know, these are very exotic faces. You know, we've gone from anti-ferromagnet to candid ferromagnets. It's really nice that you can have this local probe, this sodium, uh, nucleus to tell you what's going on. So you can get a kind of a pretty detailed picture. What I'm really surprised about is how balance was able to predict this kind of a phase diagram given all those high order couplings. Is there something, how much fine tuning is necessary for these phases to appear where they are, or you know, could Fisher have you know put some other materials together and actually produce a qualitatively similar phase diagram? You know, uh, fair question. It's um, a couple of years ago. Somebody has told me when I said what I was working on, they kind of like, oh, it's balance in his, you know, spin or yeah, multipolar order. And um, there is actually a huge effort now that he, um, you know. I think it was maybe five, six years later when he fine-tuned parameters to kind of said it should be counted ferromagnet. 
So it's just by symmetry to see what's allowed. I think what's extremely robust is the fact that you have spin, uh, that you have this orbital order, or this breaking of the lattice symmetry that has to precede these magnetic phases. The exact symmetry of these quadrupolar phases are very dependent on different models. Um, there are a lot of people now, um, huge effort at Ohio State, the immersive is all about it, calculating stuff, so they predict that, you know, we're actually testing to see whether this is unique solution or maybe four other phases that they predicted that could be, you know, this is fine tuning now, right? Mm -hmm. But the point is they're all very kind of bizarre magnets. They have, what I mean by bizarre, I mean that there are many inequivalent kind of planes. So there's like an antiferromagnet, but they all have one thing in common, which is that this orbital order precedes this. And you know the best thing to do. It's quite robust in term. It's really robust and should be observed in any 5D material. This is the simplest one because it's cubic to start with, and so that's why everybody stuck with it. I mean, if this doesn't, so there are, there's a huge effort now theoretically also. You know, you you you. He had a very simple kind of let's solve this and predict and find this. Not simple, but there are other people now developing different ways of solving Hamiltonians like that. And you know, now it becomes fine-tuning, but everybody finds this supposed orbital order there. And it would be nice to probe this, so we are dreaming <laughs> of doing oxygen exchange and try to actually get or orbital order directly, supposedly. You know. uh, Vesda, you said uh, there are two unique sodium sites, and therefore Magnetically. that and there are two uh, different hyperfine fields. Can, can you show us? Uh, the H1 is from which side? Uh, H2 is from? Let's see if this is going to work or it's going to go into, I'll show you. Yeah, this one. Yeah. yeah. So look, one is from, one, one is from, OK. You see this side here, say B. It's coupled to four atoms of B type and two A. OK, so that's one. This one is, has four A's and two B's. So I'm just saying on spin A and spin B give you a different field. And so if I have four A's plus two B's, that's different than four B's and two A's. So, so based on this structure, can you calculate uh, what H1 and H2, or at least the ratio? Uh, because is, is it solely determined by the distance between the sodium and osmium? No, no, it's, it's solely determined by we know the distance, we measure that, and it's solely determined by this angle here. You see the, the, the difference with respect to the crystalline axis of the orientation of this, of this plane and that plane. So it's determined by, you know, if you look at spins in one plane are oriented, say, like this, you see, ferromagnetically, and in the other plane above, they're, they're pointing in some different direction. And so the difference is purely determined by the angle of this orientation, yeah, which is material specific, right? So, okay. So can H1 and H2 uh, be calculated uh, based well, on? Well, they can be calculated, but yeah, and we measure that. That's exactly what I call my staggered moment, and that's something of the order of about 30 milli tesla in this material. Okay. The second question is: uh, if you dope the material, or if you change the oxygen star carometry? Are you able to get uh, superconductivity you or even be. high TC? You should be. As a matter of fact, there are predictions by you know guys doing DFT that you even if you apply the pressure, you should suppress the mod state and turn it into metal or turn it into uh, you know eventually superconductor. But they are kind of difficult. It's very difficult to dope this stuff. So that does the you know it was basically predictions that even pressure instead of doing doping, you know, to actually um, just apply the pressure and be able to supposedly induce the metallic state and eventually superconductor, right, at low temperature. So it should be. Okay, I have a question. Uh, if you go to the phase diagram. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. The dashed line is not a phase transition, right? No. So it's the system remains tetragonal from PM to BLPS. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's not a phase transition. No. I that, that's like a, 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 a pr 
precursor to a phase transition. The problem is why I think the phase transition is actually somewhere here. The it's I can only plot what I, what we okay, see. Okay. But that doesn't mean that that's where you know you started breaking. It's just a resolution of my measurement. Uh, so therefore, I have a dashed line. Oh, so this yeah. FM to PM transition is not driven by the is not a directly coupled to the tetragonal to orthorhombic transition. No. No. Well, it is. Well, <laughs> th this is here, okay? Supposedly, what I'm talking about here, you see, yeah, that dash line. So the neutron must have sh shown the phase transition somewhere, right? So are you saying no, those? No, they've never even done it actually. They haven't. It's a small uh -huh. sample, and they can. Okay. But so X-rays could not find these deformations so at all. Is, is this phase diagram a disappointment to the uh, theorist? Because there are, everybody's looking for topological phase. There's none of this no, is topological. No, not at all. Right? Not at all. It's quite. It's a very different regime. You cannot get the topological phase with this strength of electron-electron interaction. So you would have to weaken U mm -hmm. in order to go to topology. So uh, we were interviewed together, and according to balance. Uh, this is not a disappointment, it's just okay. really beautiful to show that spin orbit is important in other systems than topology, meaning okay. that you know it's a spin orbit that gives you this stuff. Yeah. Okay. That's right. according to him, but you know <laughs> <laughs> he's the one who <laughs> theorists always find a way to, you know, congratulate themselves. Uh, oh I, no. I find I'll, I take it back, I take it back. Not I take at it all. back. I take it back. Sorry. Um uh let's thank Professor Mitrovic again for a beautiful talk. Keep that in, uh, keep the, uh, yes, yes, yes.